Um, we have an hour and 35 minutes. We're not going to talk all that time. This is going to be a roundtable discussion, so we are going to open it up to the group um, after a presentation where we kind of go through some of the basics. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, not a <laughs> your head is giving a shadow. Sorry about that. Um, and sorry also that we are not able to dim the lights just for this individual room. Um, uh, but we're going to make it work. Um, so uh, this is Hacker Law for Hackers. I wanted to let you all know this is an on-the-record room. So there's Chatham House rules in the other room. This one is on the record and uh, being streamed, um, just, just so you all know. Um, leave now if that's a problem, please. Uh, and. Um, Let's do it. So like the description says, we're going to go over some of the changes to hacking law that have occurred, uh, particularly in the past uh, year or so, uh, 2021 and 2022, and look at some of the areas that are ripe now for community advocacy um, in changing hacking law to help hackers. So I'm Harley Geiger, and I am Senior Director for Public Policy at Rapid7. Uh, I'm an attorney, and I've been working in cybersecurity and technology policy for many years. And we are really blessed to have uh, this man right here from the Department of Justice, uh, co -presented. Yeah, I'm, I'm Leonard Bailey. Uh, I'm serving as Harley's wingman today. Uh, I am from the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section in the Criminal Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, I am the Special Counsel for National Security and head of our Cybersecurity Unit. Doesn't that sound very impressive? It is, in fact. My mom is very proud it of It is, me. in fact. Very, very, very impressive. Yes. yes. So believe it or not, there are no, 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 no speakers. So these, the, the microphones are actually just for streaming. So when we open up uh, to, uh, to, to the group, we're going to have to pass around these mics, but there is no amplification. Are you having, can you raise your hand if you're having trouble hearing so we me? Should be loud. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Really sorry. I thought I was already projecting. Um, feel free to, to crowd in a little bit closer if that, if that helps. I know the acoustics are not super. All right. First. This is not legal advice. Um, I, it's, very, it's very important that we get that out of the way. I, I really don't want anybody watching this to uh, go and, and do a research project and think that this covers all the nuances in the law. Uh, the law is, is just riddled with little exceptions and, and important things. We're not going to be able to cover all of that in this presentation. So if you have questions, particularly about a specific research project, if you're worried about uh, legal risks, then you should talk to a lawyer. Just not these lawyers. Do not rely on this uh, presentation. Um, okay, so let's start from the beginning. Why do we care about hackers? Why do we care about how the way that hackers are treated? a lot in our lives. We need the talent. We need the insight from people like you. It's not going to be a small cadre of, of experts. It's going to be the community. And from the government's perspective, it's, it's exactly the same thing. We know this is a complicated problem. Uh, we're not going to solve it ourselves. And there are people in this community who have skills that we simply need. So from the government's perspective, that's, that's why. AKA, the government also wants to hire you. Um, <laughs> so. Federal law has evolved in favor of hackers. Uh, I think that's a little bit provocative. I think that for a long time the security community had this impression that federal law was stacked against them and that, you know, you'll be nailed to the wall if you violate terms of service. Just, you know, you'll be nailed to the wall if you are doing IoT research in your own basement under a 40 watt bulb. Um, and I think that it's time to challenge that perspective. And I think that one of the reasons why we should challenge it has been the changes that have occurred just in the past year. So 2021 to 2022 had a lot of changes and they were almost all at least in the United States at least at the federal level sort of universally in favor of the hacking community uh, are the acoustics better am I projecting enough now sort of yeah I'm doing the best I can without yelling sorry um, we're gonna cover the computer fraud and abuse act 
the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. These are the sort of two traditional bogeymen of the security community. We're also going to talk a bit uh, about it, the international perspective. So uh, China's uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure law, and then some about the states, state laws. Um, and then, like I said, we are going to open it up to hear your, your perspective. Uh, I think we have a lot of talent and experience in this room. Um, so it's going to get interactive. We're, we're definitely not going to talk for the entire uh, hour and a half. So first up, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, so the CFAA. Um, this is maybe the most feared law in the sort of the pantheon for the security research community. And we're going to talk, start basics, we're going to talk about, you know, what, what it does. And it has a long list of restrictions. Um, I categorize them like this. So first, it's a, it's a criminal and civil statute, meaning that you can be prosecuted criminally uh, by federal prosecutors, um, but you can also be sued privately. So you can be sued by a company or by an individual if you have violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, here with the CFAA, we are talking almost entirely about other people's computers. So it is about whether you are authorized to access or use the computer in certain ways. And since you're doing it on your own computer, you're presumably authorizing yourself. Now, it gets to be a CFAA issue if you're interacting somehow with somebody else's computer. And it's not just, you know, the laptop that's sitting here. It can be things like internet servers, you know, or somebody else's computer over the internet. All right. Now, the CFAA restricts, among other things, uh, accessing a computer without authorization. Right. So if you're authorized to touch my computer or not, um, causing damage without authorization. Damage can include, for example, uh, service disruptions, DDoS, dropping malware. It can even be altering code uh, on somebody else's computer. That's considered damage without authorization. Um, and then intent to defraud. If you are, if you are, if you have intent to defraud and you are trafficking in passwords or access codes, that's also a CFA violation. And then extortion is another one. So if you are saying, I will damage your computer or I will access your computer without authorization unless you pay me cash money. That is uh, a CFA violation. Um, oh, we have, a new, we have a new projector. So most of that stuff, though, is avoidable by good faith security researchers. If you are truly conducting, you know, good faith hacking, you are not going to be demanding money for, you know, or, or you're going to, you know, threaten damage to a computer. You're not going around causing uh, DDoS attacks or, or disruptions to, to service. Um, and, uh, you know, so and you, and you also don't have intent to defraud. Your intent is to uh, patch the vulnerability. It's to improve security. But there is another provision of the CFA. And this one is arguably the most broad and most problematic for the security community, and that is exceeds authorized access. That is where most of the action in the past year has occurred. Do you want to add anything before we launch into that? Uh, no, I think you. I think you hit all the, okay. the, the buttons. So. Uh, Exceeding authorized access, what that means is you have access to a computer. You're authorized to access it, but you may only be authorized to use it for certain things. So I'm, I'm allowed to access this computer for work, but I'm not allowed to go bug hunting on it. Um, so I'm, not a, I'm not a hacker, personally. Um, or I may be able to access a social network, but not use my profile on the social network to uh, go bug hunting or to, you know, to, to conduct security research from there. Um, so that would be exceeding the authorization that I have been given to access those computers. Um, now, that gave a lot of power traditionally to things like terms of service or acceptable use policies or employment agreements because those were the documents, those were the, the, the ways that your access was defined. So if you, you know, join a social networking service, they will have an acceptable use policy or terms of service that says, here are the things you are authorized to do. Usually security research is not in that list. Same thing with employers. You know, they, they do not usually authorize their employees to also go bug hunting on their, their computers, unless that's what you do professionally. Um, so gave that gave a lot of control to that. Um, so that's some of the basics about CFAA. Now what has changed recently? And one of the big whoppers that has changed recently is Van Buren versus the United States. So that is a Supreme Court case. It was decided in 2021. And that kind of declawed exceeds authorized access. Uh, the facts of the case are pretty colorful. Uh, Van Buren was a police officer 
and Van Buren was authorized to access uh, a license plate database as part of his work. And, but Van Buren was not authorized to use that same license plate database for personal criminal purposes. And that is what Officer Van Buren did for money. Um, he was brought up under charges under CFAA, and the Supreme Court in a five to three decision, was it five to three or six to three? Uh, anyway, it was a it was not a not a five four decision. It was it was um, it, it was it was a, a, a pretty clear cut um, towards uh, finding a narrow interpretation of CFAA. What they said was essentially the question is not uh, if you've been authorized to use it for one purpose and then are using it for another. Instead, it is are the gates up or down was their analogy. Are you authorized to access the computer or are you not authorized access to, to, use, to use the computer? And so for Van Buren, what that meant was since he was authorized to use that computer for work, then it is not exceeding authorized access. It is not by itself a CFA violation to use it for other purposes as well. Um, and uh, now it may be illegal under other statutes, just not under this really broad provision of the CFAA. This helps not only security researchers, but also a lot of ordinary consumers who use the internet and should not be under threat of a federal hacking crime simply for doing things like violating terms of service, lying about your age on Facebook, for example. Um, so that was a, that was a big deal. The it also applies in part to uh, publicly available computers, right? So if a computer or an asset is on the internet and it is publicly accessible, then you arguably have authorization to access that publicly accessible computer. And if you have access for it for one authorized purpose, under Van Buren then it is not an exceeds authorized access crime any longer under the CFAA to also use it for another purpose. And that was, that theory about publicly, uh, publicly available computers was put to the test in another case in 2022. This is HiQ versus LinkedIn. So HiQ versus LinkedIn. HiQ was scraping publicly accessible content from LinkedIn. LinkedIn went so far as to send a cease and desist order to HiQ saying, don't do this any longer. Um, and the Ninth Circuit, which has traditionally looked at CFA in, in narrow ways, uh, said that LinkedIn could not bring HiQ up on CFA charges, uh, or in this case it'd be a lawsuit, uh, for scraping its publicly accessible content. It was publicly accessible. So it put Van Buren to the test on this issue of publicly accessible computers. So I want to give an example of sort of where this may hit the road with uh, an, an actual case, actual hacking. Uh, did you want to add to that? Did I describe them correctly? You, you certainly did. I, I guess there are a couple things I just I toss out, which is one of the things I think we've learned from watching courts attempt to interpret technology in, you know, generally is they're not great at it. Uh, and what occurs is something that, that you know, in, in my office we have these Talmudic discussions about whether something is like in the cyber world or something like something else in the physical world, right? And, and that's what happens in these cases. And so the Supreme Court, for example, in Van Buren, uh, spoke in language of gates up or gates down. If, if the gates are down, the restrictions apply. If the, the gates are up, um, there wasn't a lack of authorization. And exactly what a gate is may not be entirely clear as we sit here right, right now, right? Um, and uh, there were other parts of, of the opinion where they make it clear that if, for example, there are uh, files, directories, other things that are off acts uh, that are quote off limits to you, then the CFA applies. But what exactly off limits means also is something that's going to take some some interpretive work in, in courts. And so, I mean, so absolutely right, uh, what Harley said that this is this clearly has reined back the reach of the CFAA. There will be more work to be done, though, to figure out exactly what it what it means. There are things it didn't address, uh, or just that were outside the the, the ambit of of the, of the decision. For example, what is accessing a computer under the CFAA? Right, uh, which I think is a, an important question for people in this community. When you are interacting with a computer, when when does that cross the threshold of being accessed that might be actual under the statute? This case wasn't intended to address that, and so that that that's still out there to be resolved. All that said, uh, everything Harley covered was exactly spot on. Okay. Um, does anybody remember what this horrible human being did? 
Yes, go ahead. That's right. So uh, this horrible human being uh, did find the uh, addresses, email addresses of AT&T iPad users exposed on the public internet and uh, managed to scrape a great deal of this uh, and, and I, I then disclosed it to Gawker, I think, um, and uh, was brought up on CFA charges. And I, I raise this uh, to uh, just as, as an illustration that this type of prosecution um, it was already uh, difficult because there was a court split at the time. Van Buren resolved that court split, and this kind of prosecution will be a lot harder going forward. It was publicly available information, um, and now there is not a court split. Uh, so the, not to say that there would not be uh, any potential liability, but it would be a lot harder to bring a case like this uh, now than it was previously. I just want to say one more thing about this this case. I think it was U.S. versus Spittler. But, um, so uh, uh, Harley hit on this earlier. There's, there was a perception that um, security researchers were being prosecuted um, far and wide. And when, when we first began engaging with this community in 2014 or so, uh, we took that back and we actually thought about that because we were concerned. We wanted to make sure we weren't chilling research. And what we found in the last decade was this is the only case the federal government has brought against the security researcher. Okay? Um, for now, security research. For security research. Uh, there may have been other cases brought by state authorities, uh, but this is the sole case in the last decade against the security researcher. That may surprise some of you. Um, and just so you know, you, you don't have to accept our word for it. The uh, Center for Democracy and Technology also took a look at this. Uh, and in 2017, they found the, the exact same thing. The, um, that said, and we'll talk about this later, there are reasons why this community associates the CFAA with, uh, let's say, aggressive restrictions. Uh, and we'll get to that later, but I'll give you a spoiler alert. It has to do with the civil portion of the statute. So. So that is one change, is those series of cases, Van Buren and HiQ. Um, it's a big deal. It solves a split that was in circuit courts for like at least 10 years, I think. Um, now, limitations. The, the ch that change does not, it, it, that's a different part of the statute than if you're causing damage or if you have intent to defraud, right? So if you cause damage, you know, or if you are out there trying to defraud people, that is, uh, this change is not actually going to help you. Uh, this is about exceeding your authorized access. And it's federal. So it applies just to, this, just to the, the federal law, just to CFA. It's different from the states, and we're going to cover the states in a bit. Now, but it's still a big deal. And on top of that news, uh, in 2022, in fact, in the past, what, four months or so, uh, the Department of Justice uh, changed its charging policy for, uh, for CFAA. And here is a look at that. I, don't worry about reading through the block of text too, too carefully. Um, we, we can parse this language a little bit later. Um, but this is, a, uh, this is also this is public. Um, and who better to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, so uh, in, in May of this year, uh, we announced this, this policy. And it's sort of uh, maybe the, the, the capstone of a, a number of years of work with, with folks like Harley and others in this community who, uh, in a very open-handed way, allowed us to kind of understand better how, how the community works and to get more comfortable with the idea that there may be some allowances for actors in this, in this community, again, in the interest of improving cybersecurity. So in May of this year, we, we announced this policy that uh, essentially says that an assistant U.S. attorney, we have 94 districts across the country that have federal prosecutors in them who are responsible for these types of cases. Uh, we are the office at Maine Justice that oversees this statute. Um, every indictment across the country has to come through our office. Um, and so we promulgated the policy to the U.S. Attorney's offices saying that they should decline a prosecution if the activity involved good faith computer security research, um, meaning, and I won't delve too far into this because we'll talk about this later on the DMCA, but essentially uh, activity that involves testing, um, examining, correcting, accessing computer to do those things 
to identify a security flaw or vulnerability. And it's done in a way that avoids harm to the public or individuals and is primarily for the purpose of producing information to protect the class of devices, machines, or online services. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's a lengthy way of attempting to capture what it is people, we understand, attempt to do in this community. And let me tell you, that wasn't easy to try to capture in, in, in words. It took a lot of toing and throwing, but, um, but we'll talk about this more. But here we are. The Department of Justice has changed its charging policy for, for charging crimes under the CFAA to say you should decline it if the defendant is a good faith security researcher. Um, the language that, that is up there, again, we'll, we'll parse through it a bit more, but that is borrowed from another, another part of the law where a lot of these conversations were happening um, and is sort of becoming now a lot of standard language around defining good faith security research, for better or worse, and it's, nothing is perfect. But that, again, may, so this is, this is in the past year, a big change on, on the heels of those court cases. Now, the limitation there is that that is for criminal law. So it does not apply to civil suits. Remember, you can still be sued under the CFA by private companies. And I will say that at, anecdotally, in speaking with researchers at Rapid7, um, and speaking with, like, at, while, while at Rapid7, speaking with researchers external to Rapid7 and within Rapid7, um, it, we, we are seeing that much more uh, uh, private lawsuits uh, than uh, over things like criminal prosecution. Um, you know, we, and it is kind of a hard thing to measure because a lot of the private lawsuits come in the, in the, the form of a, of a threat, like a cease and desist letter, and doesn't ever reach the stage where it actually becomes a lawsuit. You know, a lot of times the, the researcher will back down or they'll work it out with the company, but it is still uh, a, major uh, a major problem for, for researchers. So just that, that civil, uh, civil suit aspect of it. The charging policy does not apply. Um, do we want to say anything else about CFA? I guess there's only one other thing I should say, uh, just in the, in the interest of candor. Uh, well, I said there have been no prosecutions of security researchers. Um, there may be a question about, well, have they been investigated? And there I'd have to concede there have been investigations, um, but you have to kind of cut us a little slack there. And that is because if you're, let's say, penetration testing a system that you don't have an agreement with, what you are necessarily doing is something that looks identical to someone who is actually trying to, let's say, break into a system. And so there's no way of telling what's going on until and unless there's a little bit of investigative activity. And so there still could be a knock on the door asking, what are you doing? Uh, the point is that has not progressed and is not progressing to a prosecution. Uh, and so, you know, we, we also are better at understanding the difference between certain types of activity uh, that is actually a precursor to actual, um, you know, intrusions versus others. Uh, like. For example, mere scanning, mere port scanning is not going to end up with someone knocking on your door uh, asking, you know, from for your government. bona fides, from the government, I should say. Uh, but that, that wasn't necessarily the case going back a decade ago. Um, but I think that, that is something that has changed. So I, I just wanted to clear, clear that one, one point. And so just to recap, the changes, those major court cases that are, you know, curbing in a, in a big way the most problematic part of the CFAA and then the DOJ's charging policy change, you know, all since 2021. This is the next uh, big important one. So this is Section 1201 of the DMCA. So the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, here is a law that if it were proposed today would not even get a hearing in Congress. It's, it is archaic and clunky and it wastes everybody's time. Um, and arguably, it is broader than the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Because remember I mentioned that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act largely applied to other people's computers. Section 1201 of the DMCA applies to other people's computers and your computer. So you, it can apply to you where you're, you're you know, doing IoT research in your basement you know, under a 20-watt bulb. Like that, it, it, it does apply to you. What it does, is, there we go. Uh, what it does is it restricts, here comes the lawyer speak, circumventing a technological protection measure to a protected work, a copyrighted work. So what does that mean for hackers? Circumventing a technological protection measure to a copyrighted work is what you do all the time to software. So a technological protection measure can be something like encryption or um, a login, so anything that is protecting access to software. And so that 
because you license software uh, does not mean that you have authorization from the copyright holder to conduct that research. And that it can be software that is on your own device. Uh, it doesn't have to be just on somebody else's device. So arguably this has been broader. And a lot of times when I've seen cease and desist letters that are sent out to researchers, it's both. Uh, there's a citation for CFAA as well as DMCA uh, thrown in there. Um, so I think the best thing about this law, the, you know, the best you could say for it, is that it gives the Copyright Office, or technically the Librarian of Congress, but we'll just say the Copyright Office, uh, the ability to every three years make an exception to this rule, uh, this prohibition on restricting uh, or uh, circumventing TPMs. And so 2015 was, was actually the first time that there was a, a, a security research uh, exception to uh, Section 1201 that did not rely on the uh, authorization of the copyright holder. Um, and there was a lot of folks that were doing unsung work in the community uh, to, to, try to, get, to try to make that happen. Uh, Andrew Matwishin, the Center for Democracy and Technology, EFF, um, like, like you don't hear their names proclaimed from the rooftops, but, like, but this process was where a lot of the cutting edge conversations were happening uh, for cybersecurity uh, researcher protections. And uh, it evolved every three years. So 20, 2015, 2018, and 2021, I think that what we finally have is decent protection that you can hang your hat on for the vast majority of research. And we're going to look at the language. So good faith research. Sorry if this is not a sharper image here for you. Um, accessing a computer program solely for the purposes of good faith testing, investigation, or correction of a security flaw or vulnerability. Right? So that's the research part. And then the rest are sort of caveats on doing it responsibly. So where the research is carried out in an environment designed to avoid harm to the public, uh, where the information that you're taking from it are used for security, right? So you're using it to promote the security of the devices that you are, are researching. And you're not, you had to throw this in because remember this is a copyright-based statute, and you're not using this uh, information in a manner that it facilitates copyright infringement. Um, now, I don't know if you caught a lot of the, the language in the Department of Justice's charging policy. It's identical. They, the Department of Justice borrowed from this exception that came out of the Copyright Office. This is, in fact, government's uh, best attempt, best stab at articulating what y'all do when, we, when you're doing security research. Um, and I know that there is a lot of different terms, right, like a uh, white hat hacker, ethical hacker. Uh, they went with good faith, uh, good faith security research, I think because good faith has, carries a lot of legal precedent. Um, and now we are actually seeing that term uh, come up in a lot of other places that we're not even going to cover here. So for, for whatever it's worth, um, the description, you know, white hat hacker, ethical, ethical, uh, ethical hacker, uh, good faith security research is the one that has momentum in a lot of policy circles. Um, Oh, please. So, uh, I'm just curious, how many of you are, are lawyers? Okay, a good, a good number of us. So, <laughs> so I, I, this, is, this one statute I, uh, amuses me in part because, so there's this, this triennial process, right, uh, whereby the Librarian of Congress looks at the copyright laws and decides whether there's an exception. And it's, again, every three years, like, they sat around and said, two? No, that's not. Four? No, we're going to go three uh, for some reason. So every three years, there's a chance to, to alter the law. Back in, I believe it was 2018, we became aware that this was up for consideration. And we uh, decided we were going to weigh in. And so we did something we haven't done before, which was we issued a formal letter um, to the Library of Congress uh, in support of of the security research exception, because uh, looking at it, we felt uh, it, it made sense. And then in 2021, it was up again uh, because some of the restrictions on uh, security research that were in the exemption in 2015 were considered maybe too narrow. And uh, we looked at that again and, and found that we could actually agree with expanding it in various ways. And because part of my office, where I'm from the computer crime and intellectual property section, we actually enforce the criminal DMCA provisions, um, uh, the Library of Congress actually was was pretty amenable to to our position. Um, so just to, to, to kind of give you a little more history on on how this this came to be, I think I want to 
put it a little more bluntly, the Department of Justice stood up for researchers on two separate occasions in this process over a period of years. Uh, they put their money where their mouth is and got involved with another agency saying, do better to protect researchers. Um, that is really substantive. You know, from a, from a law enforcement agency, when they say that they want to protect researchers, they it's behind the scenes, it's kind of inside baseball, but it actually, I was there. I was, I was, you know, one of the people that was pushing the copyright office to have better protections, and the Department of Justice's letters had a big effect on on the the, the copyright office actually improving these protections. And I'll, I'm sorry, I have to jump in here just so this is entirely a kumbaya moment. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that did happen though over these years is that. Uh, the people in this community were willing to sit down with us and have good, candid conversations about the way in which research is conducted. Uh, and, and so I, I think this is really a, a good example of collaboration between, you know, what in many times is viewed as antagonistic parties, uh, but actually are two parties that are working towards a common goal, which is better security um, and protection of, of people's information and assets. So this was uh, 2021 when this was released. I think it was late 2021. Um, but consider the timeline also, right? 2015, it started before 2015. Uh, so this was a period of like seven, eight years just working with the Copyright Office alone on this. Um, I think EFF had started even several years before that. I mean, it, like talk about, you know, the way that policy moves slowly. One of the reasons for that is because you, you oh, we managed to do it. That's terrific, I, I'm assuming. Is that better for everybody? Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so there, uh, I'll, I'll tell you just a, a war story. So in, in 2018, um, we heard from uh, other, other trade associations and uh, you know, other sort of interests who were, uh, wanted strong, uh, copyright to be, to be better protected you know, and, and thought that, that was more prioritized than security research. And they said things like, if we don't have restrictions on security research, we're going to have unfettered hacking of elections. We're going to have people hacking planes. We're going to have people hacking cars on, on highways. It'll be, uh, you know, they'll be uh, hacking cars in such a way that they are violating pollution laws, to which our response had always been, well, there are other laws that take care of that. We don't have to rely on this one to do it. Um, but that took you know, like at least four years to overcome that argument. Um, and, now, and now we have. The language that you see here does not have that same caveat uh, in it. This is an example of research. Why would this not fit the language that we just saw? Yes. That's right. That's right. So this is uh, this was 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 on a highway, but the uh, th this particular example was brought up in uh, the Section 1201 proceedings as both a for and against. Right? We were saying, well, look, the, the research actually did result in Jeep recalling uh, the, these vehicles for safety purposes. This was valuable to society. On the other side, we heard people saying, no, this is terrible. Look at what these folks can do. They can stop it on a highway and put everybody at risk. Um, so yes, this is, uh, this is one of those caveats. This is why uh, this specific example made a, made a lot of, of waves in policy land and is one of the reasons why that, uh, that language there. Yes. So it'd be authorized access to the machinery, right, to the to the computer maybe, but not to the software on the computer, um, because the software is copyrightable, and that's the way 1201, Section 1201 works, is that you have to get the authorization of the copyright holder. And uh, and in this case, they, they did not have authorization of the copyright holder, even if they had the authorization of the person who owned the Jeep. Art? Yes. Circumvent a technical measure. Yeah, that's a requirement of the statute. I think it probably depends on the specifics. So, 
a big limitation on that. All right, so now you have, again, just in the past year, you've got better, much better protections under Section 1201 of the DMCA for good faith security research. Uh, there is a limitation to it, which is that uh, that protection, it does not apply, and, and actually the Copyright Office cannot make it apply, they're not authorized by law, to trafficking in the tools. So if you are making the tools available publicly, uh, e even you know, just not for profit, put it out on Twitter, then that may violate Section 1201 of the DMCA, but a different part of it, one that does not uh, fall under the protections that we just discussed. So the act of research is protected, but the disclosure of the tools and the techniques may not be. Yes? Yes, there will be there will be time for questions. Um, but if if you want, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be loose with it. Um, 
um, is intelligence gathering on the dark web or purchasing your information back on the dark web. Uh, if you if you did a web search for uh, cybersecurity unit DOJ, you'll land on, there'll be a landing page, and uh, on there are links to various white papers. One of them actually covers, and I think is rather instructive on this issue. Yeah, no, I guess, uh, I, guess uh, um, the, I guess in lawyers speak, you wouldn't be actually accessing a computer without authorization, right? The data is out somewhere else. Right, but, but it's not, right, you have not accessed the computer from which it was stolen. Um, it is just data that someone has posted somewhere. And you're accessing their computer with authorization, you know, as it's posted on the web. Um, but that would not be a CFA violation by itself. But that's CFAA. I mean, there are other laws that can apply, like uh, receipt of stolen property, um, some privacy laws. So it depends on the situation. And, and just, I think, be aware that there are more laws in the CFAA that may apply to that situation. And on that score, I would re recommend the paper that I, I flagged because we get into some of the other issues. And we have I'm going to be very lawyerly and weasley. Um, the, the simple answer is the, the facts will matter, right? So if you, uh, for example, will take um, Weave, uh, the case that, that we talked about before, um, he had access through this AT&T server, which was configured to essentially populate certain fields um, when you access it if you had an AT&T uh, iPad. Um, uh, you know, he identified what some would argue is a security vulnerability that shouldn't have existed. He wrote then a Perl script that allowed him to do that 116,000 times, right? Which did then kind of move it out of what today we would consider good faith security research. Now, if you're saying you access this, you saw this, um, and then perhaps you reported it, um, that would help, right, in terms of how, what we're thinking. You should be in the mindset, though, of thinking, how will someone perceive my actions? Not my intent, but my actions, because it's very difficult to discern what your motives are. So if someone, for example, identifies your IP address coming from wherever you are as accessing this particular server, and there's nothing else going on, um, again, you may get a knock at the door. There may be some questions. Um, you should do everything you can, though, to make it clear what it is you're doing. Again, the same uh, paper I talked about before goes into this a bit. That is, to the extent that, for example, you work for a company and there is a work plan that demonstrates that this is a manner in which you collect cyber threat intelligence information. That would be helpful. Not dispositive necessarily, but helpful. But that's the advice I could give you here. Put yourself in the mindset of, without knowing your intent, what do my actions look like, and how can I demonstrate that my actions are not those, actually, of someone who would do this for malicious purposes? All right. Uh, thank you. I'm going to try to get us back on track. Um, if we have questions that are not, like, sort of directly related to what we're talking about, we should hold those to the end. We do have time for a roundtable, so we will have time to get to the questions, but let's try to keep it to what we're talking about now, just for the, folk, the, the, the flow of, of conversations so that folks get the information. Um, we were talking about Section 1201 of the DMCA, and we said that this good faith security research exception, which came out in uh, 2021, um, provides good protection but does not cover trafficking. So trafficking in the tools, the exploits, the techniques. So and that can in, and trafficking sounds like it, it might be more complicated than it is, but it could just be public disclosure of, of those things. Um, and this is the basis of the Apple versus Corellium lawsuit. Um, this was partially settled in 2021. Um, we don't have the details of the settlement, but originally it was uh, that Corellium was violating that trafficking uh, uh, portion of the statute. 
And uh, one of the reasons that it was settled, in fact, was uh, from uh, pressure from the cybersecurity community that put out a statement saying we should not be uh, suppressing the use of cybersecurity tools. We don't want uh, there to be the case that like a public disclosure of techniques and tools is, is outlawed under Section 1201. It is a bad cybersecurity situation to say everybody must develop their own uh, because those tools will not be uh, as, as good and, and uh, able to, uh, to actually improve uh, cybersecurity. Yes. I think that is one of the things that was kind of eye-opening about the lawsuit, was that there did not seem to be an exception for open source. And if the, t if the techniques and tools can circumvent a technological protection measure, you know, to a copyrighted work, which, you know, a lot of open source tools do, uh, then, then yes, it could violate that. This is not a part of the statute that we see come up very often. And I think that it was under the radar quite a bit, and it is one that we don't have that op opportunity, you know, to come to the copyright office every three years for an exception. That has to be something that is done by Congress, and Congress does what Congress does. So... We talked about CFAA and we talked about uh, DMCA. Um, I want to look at the states as well. So if you are, you know, wherever, wherever you are reside, and if you look up your state and then computer crime law, it will be worthwhile to take a look at those statutes. Many of them are very similar to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. They use similar language, access without authorization. Some of them say exceeds authorized access, just like the CFAA did. What's different, one of the things that's different, is that it has not gone through that evolution that we just discussed for CFAA. There is no Van Buren counterpart to state computer crime laws. Um, there's no DOJ charging policy. It does not apply to the state computer crime laws. Those are enforced by states. They go through state courts. This is our federalist system. Um, and so uh, some of the states end up actually having language that is even more broad than the CFAA. In Missouri, uh, which is actually where I'm from, is, is one of those examples. Um, and in 2021, we, we had this, this issue where the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, uh, a reporter for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch found uh, on their Department of Education website that the social security numbers of uh, many educators were revealed. Um, and this was not a very complicated exposure. Um, it looked like like hitting F12 and looking at the source of the website revealed this. It was disclosed to the agency, which initially said thank you. Somehow it became political, and the governor said that this was hacking. This was unacceptable, and that you know we should have a law enforcement investigation. Uh, the Highway Patrol did investigate the Post Dispatch. Did investigate the reporter. Um, no charges were brought. And what the Highway Patrol said at the time was that there was no criminal intent. Obviously, this is true. This is also true for good faith cybersecurity research. That's also not what's required in the statute. The statute does not require criminal intent. It actually does not require intent to defraud. Um, it is whether or not you are accessing the computer at all. It also, uh, Missouri is one of those states that says that if you disclose an access code or a password uh, without authorization, then you are in violation of their state law. Now, in the CFAA, if you're disclosing an access code or a password, that requires intent intent to defraud to be illegal under the CFAA. Here again, no intent to defraud. It's just if you should have known that you did not have authorization to disclose the password. So for example, you're conducting IoT research. One of the routine things that you see with IoT cybersecurity research is finding a hard-coded password in the device. Are you allowed to disclose that under Missouri law? Do you have authorization to do it? This is what I'm talking about. You, it would not be it would not be a violation under CFAA. Arguably, not anymore under DMCA. Now that we have that protection, but you have state laws that are just as broad or more broad than the CFAA and don't, don't have some of the same limiting factors that we've discussed. Maryland is another. Um, so in Maryland, uh, in fact, so Missouri is one where it says if you are disclosing a password or an access code without authorization, Maryland, in fact, makes it a crime. Uh, home of the NSA makes it a crime to try to identify an access code or, or a password. So not even just the disclosure, the act of research to try to identify the password or the access code. Um, it is, is illegal. No, again, no intent to defraud required. Um, and then, by contrast, like just to show you, show you some of the variation here, there's the state of Washington. 
the state of Washington actually has, and the only one I know of in states, it has a bona fide security researcher protection. Um, and this is, here they call it white hat security research. Um, the way that they do it is they say you can't do a bunch of stuff without authorization, just like CFAA, but without authorization is defined. And without authorization does not include white hat security research. And if you see the definition of white hat security research up there at the top, you'll see that a lot of that also mimics the uh, language that was in that section 1201 exception. Yes. So I hope that there are more questions and we haven't answered them all already. Um, so in 2021, uh, China uh, publicized, after a, a comment period, it publicized a coordinated vulnerability disclosure and patching law. Um, it is the, uh, the, the regulations on the management of security vulnerabilities of network products. Um, and this law requires uh, companies uh, to have vulnerability disclosure policies. That's great. It requires patching of vulnerabilities. This is, this is, this is required. Um, it also, though, requires vendors to disclose vulnerabilities to the government within two days of discovery. So you discover the vulnerability, you flow it up to the government. Uh, two days, that is going to be a lot of unpatched vulnerabilities. Researchers, believe it or not, are actually kind of encouraged. There's a, you're encouraged to have bug bounties uh, if, you are, if you are a vendor. Um, but remember, the vulnerabilities that you hear flow up to the government within about two days. Um, 
Now, what is what is very different from the sort of the way that we are used to things here in the U.S. is that there is a strict restriction on public disclosure uh, of the vulnerabilities and a strict restriction on publishing tools. So as a security researcher, under this law, and at least under the, the letter of the law, I can't speak to how it's enforced on the ground. I have no visibility into that. But the letter of the law is that you must report the vulnerability either to the vendor or to the government. Those are your options. And remember, if you report it to the vendor, the vendor reports it directly to the government anyway. So you know, bug bounties, CVD, and it flows to, to the government. Um, and the, uh, the, the penalties for violating this uh, can include imprisonment. I mean, it is, it is a, a, a criminal law. Um, but it also includes things like administrative fines. I mean, there's a wide array of, of, of penalties. Um, so this is in stark contrast sort of to the, uh, the direction that we are moving in with the United States where it comes to uh, adopting coordinated vulnerability disclosure, sort of you know, uh, recognizing the hacker community in our criminal laws, and, uh, and also you know, continuing to preserve the ability to disclose vulnerabilities publicly. Do you want to add anything? No? So this is the last slide. Uh, well, last substantive slide. So where do we go from here? Um, and just want to wheel it back to the point that we made at the beginning, that a lot of the researcher community had previously been focused on the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but that exceeds authorized access, terms of service problems, um, and Section 1201 of the DMCA. I would argue that you can still do that. Those, those things are absolutely not perfect. But you're not going to get the same bang for your buck that you had prior to 2021. Right? Now, areas of greater legal risk, I would argue, are in the U.S. states which have not had any of that same evolution as federal law. Uh, international laws like uh, China's CVD law is another big one. Um, speaking of CVD, another area to focus on is uh, continued adoption of coordinated vulnerability disclosure with private companies. And one reason for that is, remember, not all of the protections under CFA apply to private lawsuits. Those are, are often the greater threat than, uh, than criminal liability. And for Section 1201 of the DMCA, uh, that protection, although it comes up for renewal every three years, it's, I, I'm relatively confident it is pretty baked uh, at this point. We may be able to improve it some further, but I, I doubt that unless there's a major event that we would do a lot of backsliding. What does need improvement in a major way are the, is the trafficking portion. So I actually think that this is what, what we talked about here today, the, the progress on CFA, DMCA, is in part due, in large part due, to security community advocacy. Um, it has been a powerful force, but now let's turn it towards the areas of greater legal risk, and uh, especially the states, um, where we are all from, and where our lawmakers have similar processes to the federal lawmakers. I think that that is the next area where we can get the best bang for our buck in our advocacy. And that is the uh, uh, security research exception from 1201 DMCA. If you want to look at it some more, I figured we might end up talking about it in this Q&A session, which begins now. Um, yes, please. Uh, Holly, first of all, thanks for coming to the GSMA to, to present on the China law. Uh, so I'm the chair of the um, Fraud and Security Group, we have an industry-based CVD scheme, uh, so it's still quite unclear to us. We have asked MIIT uh, what the situation is and not got a response. Um, so, you know, for companies that are involved in our CVD committee, some of which are Chinese, whether they have to disclose those vulnerabilities. So that, that's the first point I want to make, which is of concern. Uh, the second one is from, on the international law aspect. So in the UK, we have the um, what's called the PSTI bill going through Parliament right now, which is the Product Security and Telecommunications Infrastructure Bill, which is our IoT Act when it gets passed. And in that, uh, there will be a requirement for companies to provide CVD. Um, and that a lot of that work has been promoted really from here. So, so thanks everyone for, for getting that just close to the line and getting into law. So thank you. The, the proliferation of coordinated vulnerability, vulnerability disclosure policies and uh, standards, I think, deserves its own talk of similar length. But that is another major area of progress um, from the from the hacker community into policy. Um, Peter, uh, uh, you um, so you were you were uh, the UK is looking at the Computer Misuse Act also, right? And they, one of the things that the government is considering there, I think one of the questions that they asked was, should there be an explicit protection for security researchers? Do I have that right? 
Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm David. Peter is around this week. But, um, yeah, so um, the Home Office has consulted on this, and I think at the moment they're kind of uh, quite busy with other things, but uh, that's what they're looking at. And I think clearly, you know, the precedent work that's happening in the United States is going to feed into that. So I personally was quite pleased to see all of this because we can put that into that work. I think there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of kind of input needs to go into it. There's a maturity of thinking that needs to happen. So on the PSTI bill, actually, when it went to the House of Lords, which is our upper house, um, there were questions raised um, about whether by putting CVD into law that they're creating a defence for malicious hacking. And so then it got into this kind of basically letters and mark discussion, which, which um, I don't think we want to go down that road, to be honest. So, I mean, so the, the UK right now has a, has a process where they're looking at the Computer Misuse Act. It's sort of their version of the CFAA. So if you have contacts with the UK government, um, or if you want to get involved with that, see David and uh, see about weighing in. And uh, I mean, that is an area of open consultation right now, looking at potential legal protections for researchers in the UK. Yes, Amit. Follow-on question. Oh, I'm sorry. Follow-on question on, on this. If I ask, as you can tell, I'm from the UK as well. Accent kind of gives it away. One of the one of the dangers um, that we're looking at in the UK with that rethink of the uh, Computer Misuse Act is organisations in the UK trying to define cybersecurity researchers as people who have received a certification handed out by a government department and who have registered on a government list as being validated security researchers and that's one of the big problems and one of the dangers that we're seeing in the UK is that their definition of cyber security researcher is kind of being pushed towards a government approved cyber security researcher which is a, a, a danger that we need to fight against and, and an ongoing struggle with this review of the Computer Misuse Act because we kind of don't want to lock out people who are not government sanctioned in some way. That's absolutely, I'm glad you raised that. Um, that's absolutely real. Uh, so the UK government also put out a consultation on certification for cybersecurity professionals. Um, and this would be certification for a variety of cybersecurity professional jobs. Um, it's, if you work in the UK um, or if your work touches the UK, um, this, this affects you. But one of them was, uh, was security researchers. Um, and yes, it, it lends itself to being on an, an approved government list, being a certified in order to uh, to conduct security research, which is, uh, I mean, a huge barrier to entry for a, what is, in the United States at least, a very decentralized community. Um, yes, and sorry, I mean, uh, that was UK, UK specific. Um, okay, um, wanted to quickly follow up on the issue of growth vulnerability disclosure program requirements and CVD requirements, uh, as well as bug bounties and uh, contractual mechanisms in particular. And this is a great opportunity to also shed light on one more item, which is tremendous and wonderful work from the Department of Justice, but was released in 2017, which is the framework for considerations, right, for how to do vulnerability disclosure, which also included a provision that talks about potential implications under the CFAA, as well as encouragement for organizations to include explicit 
Um, let's take the first part of that question first, and I want to put, and this, did you want to answer the CVD question? I want to put Art Manion on the spot. Um, the, you, you heard Amit's question about the next, next, uh, next frontier for CVD in, in the marketplace. What do you think? How do we get you a microphone? I'm sorry. That's true. Good thinking. And reminder that the microphones don't have a speaker that's for the, the stream, so we still have to project. Uh, I did hear I mostly tracked I meet. Um, let's see. So I think you've touched on them here, and then I meet with the commercial contractual stuff. Hard. So um, bug bounty related, disclosure policy related, safe harbor, but not in strict legal safe harbor terms, but I appreciate, right? Um, good faith security research. So contractually and in bug bounty and disclosure programs, I think there's going to be progress there. Right, if people are agreeing and pl playing within those agreements, there's less likely to be any conflict, whether civil or, you know, a, a, a recognition from a government, perhaps, uh, or a federal prosecution. Um, the, the the Chinese law is a good example. Um, it's concerned a lot of us, although the implications are not clear yet. I don't think. Um, but what if? Uh, how many countries are there on the planet? Two hundred some, if you, depending how you count. What if every sovereign state has its own report to the government law with different numbers of days and different different industries and things? So that has the potential to get really messy. Um, and I'm sure particularly a multinational uh, corporation or a researcher who works across you know country lines would appreciate um, something more globally standard as opposed to you know needing a needing a third party to tell them how to talk to this country, that country, that country. Um, I think that could be a mess, but the uh, jury's out still. Do you have a, a view as to where CVD adoption might spike next? Like, are, are there sectors or is it just sort of company by company? Uh, I don't think I have a, a real view or opinion. Um, there's a lot of progress, which is great to see. Um, UK was mentioned. The rest of Europe uh, in the NISA and the NIS2 has uh, disclosure stuff built in there, I believe. I think it's going to go through. So, you know, those are signs of progress. The, the Chinese stuff is concerning, but again, I'll speak for myself. I'm reading a English Google translation. Don't know how the law is actually implemented in country, so not sure yet. So I guess um, for, for my own part, I don't know where the next the next uh, 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 sectors of the economy or sectors of the market that will implement CVD will will be like where the sort of the low hanging fruit is. Um, but I know that you've noticed the same thing, which is that uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure policies are now being built into a lot of cybersecurity laws. Um, so the Infrastructure Incident Reporting Act has a nod towards it. Um, there are there are laws like um, you know thing like the IoT uh, Cybersecurity and Innovation Act, right? That had a, a requirement that if you were going to sell IoT to the government that you must have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure policy. Um, this too, which is like a critical infrastructure protection law um, that is being uh, proposed in Europe, is at a pretty advanced stage, requires coordinated vulnerability disclosure policies. Um, we're seeing it in, in a lot of um, sort of regulations that you may not even expect from different agencies for just for their particular sector are at, at the very least promoting uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Um, uh, you, you had mentioned, oh please. I was going to respond to that because um, my company has also been tracking the implementation of CVD by IoT companies over the past five years and we're just about to do the research again. So we look at about 330 companies uh, that are sort of the top, the top IoT products in uh, countries across the world. And we started out, it was less than 10% of companies had any way for a security researcher to contact them. And that includes, um, you, you know, the security.txt as well and, 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 and looking at a website and so on. And that only increased, even in light of all of this global activity promoting CVD, that only increased uh, to less than 20% in our last year's survey. So even with the threat of regulation, even with laws in place, there's a, there's a huge amount of companies, you know, four in five IoT companies are not doing anything. And that's just the bit that you can see. So it's really concerning to me. I mean, you know, when the laws come in, I'm hoping that obviously the stick comes out and they actually do something. Um, but it'll be really interesting to see what happens this year and next year in our survey and if there's this massive increase or not.
there's a there's this trope, right, that policy and regulation is always way behind where the private sector is. I don't think that's true for coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Um, we're seeing it built into a lot of cybersecurity uh, laws, best practices, you know, guides, things like that out of out of DC at least, um, the UK, the EU, uh, China, and uh, I think that the, the, its representation in new cybersecurity regulations is more uh, uh, more broad than where we're seeing it actually in the marketplace. Um, so there is still a lot of catch up. I would not. I'm optimistic because it is making its way into policy, but there is still a long way to go in terms of actual adoption. Whether uh, the good faith exception is is a matter of law uh, uh, or policy, I guess, and why should why should folks care? Um, so, in regard to the CFA and the federal policy, it is it is a matter of policy, right? So it is not um, written into the law, and that has certain dangers. Uh, folks have, have flagged that that means it is possible that another administration could have a different view of this or a different attorney general or turn another head of the criminal division. Um, I will say that we have a number of policies that I think are comparable that have persisted across multiple administrations and they have not, as a matter of course, like changed every four years or anything like of that sort. But that, that is one, one important distinction, that if it's written into law, it is less likely to, to change. Um, the reason it's not is because it's very difficult to get anything written into law right now. So, um, so this is not a bad, a bad second to that. Congress can spend trillions of dollars, but they can't change the law. I did want to jump on one issue about bug bounties uh, that, was, that just prompted something I wanted to kind of say as a kind of public service announcement. Um, and it's, it's something that, uh, that we've noticed, I think, over the last few years. And that is, uh, while we are very supportive of bug bounty programs because we think they do a good job of letting the different parties know where lines are drawn, what is in bounds, what, what's out of bounds, um, the one danger that we see that has manifested in a few places is it also in some instances has created a sense of entitlement among researchers such that there's a feeling that if I did some work here, I better get paid, which can inform the manner in which any discussion about compensation or disclosure or things occur. And in the worst instances is exactly what we talked about earlier, can turn into a conversation that looks a lot more like an extortionate type of demand rather than some, uh, some you know, engagement to try to improve security. Uh, and so I, I, I just drop that as a, as a caution. Uh, you know, in the course of reviewing indictments that have come through our office, you know, we've had a couple of instances where researchers used maybe some improvident words in the manner in which they approached this. Um, and this harkens back to an issue that I've I flagged before, which is I, I truly believe it would be in this community's interests to work on norms that are some sort of baseline understanding of what you know security research and engagement looks like, so that those who of like like me who are outside the community who would try to apply those rules have something to go to that's not imposed on the community by us, but rather is something organically developed so that there's actually buy-in and an understanding and a real, you know, true depiction of that, the way in which things should occur. So I, that's my PSA that I wanted to just drop on you. you know, I realize we skipped over your second question. Oh, on, well, I, I, I skipped over to on, on uh, incident reporting and how that interacts with the CFAA. And one thing I have noticed, so there's, there's so incident reporting, there are a lot of regulations uh, already on the books and a lot that are being proposed that would require a company to report a cybersecurity incident to the government, to, to their regulator. Um, and the definition of cybersecurity incident is usually something that is significant, uh, not just, you know, a, 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 you know an insignificant exposure, but something that is relatively significant significance that the government knows about it and can um, have, take action to protect others. Um, something, and, and this is another, you know, sort of sign of, of the evolution uh, in uh, thinking about policy and hackers. Um, a lot of 
these laws actually have an exception toward to the incident uh, requirements so that it doesn't qualify as a reportable incident if it is something that was brought to you by a good faith security researcher. Uh, many of them don't use necessarily those words. Um, in, I think a lot of times it requires authorization of the of the, the computer holder. So like, but something like a bug bounty, if you know, if a bug bounty has has, a, has brought it or a, it's a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process, uh, then it may not qualify for incident reporting purposes to have to report it to the regulator. This is a sort of thinking that we, I think, five, ten years ago couldn't imagine, but they're building it into things that, you know, as somewhat niche, you know, cyber incident reporting. And so they're, they have a mind towards this community even there. Yes. said. Um, no, that's okay. Um, can I suggest you at least for this question take the mask off? Sorry. Um, <laughs> interspersed 20%. Yeah, right. <laughs> on the policy is exercised in, in the U.S. by our investigators and prosecutors uh, and kind of taking as a model that there's a, a comparable law in, in the U.K. Where, they, where a lot of discretion is used to, uh, to determine what is in the public interest. Um, so um, in terms of the discretion, I guess the policy does state and, you know, promulgated by the Deputy Attorney General's office to all um, is that one should decline if it meets these criteria. The question of when it meets these criteria um, is a matter of discretion to some degree, but no more so than I would say applying our laws, right, to see whether the set of facts meets the, the requirements here. Um, and so I, I think there's, in some ways, unavoidably, a certain degree of discretion that's, that's exercised. Uh, but one of, I think, the positive things is one of the things that helps when you have exercises of discretion is to have kind of oversight and transparency. And so this wouldn't be a decision that would be made solely by, for example, the U.S. Attorney's Office. We oversee all of the CFA indictments. So it would come through us as well. And the point of that, which was a uh, practice that was adopted in 2016, was to try to harmonize how these things are done nationally, right? So if you have one collection point, you can have greater consistency than you would have in 94 different districts. And so there is discretion. We believe, though, that we have mechanisms for, for kind of leveling that out uh, and making sure that, that it is consistent. You'll notice at the bottom of the charging policy, it mentions consulting with prosecutors. Yeah, that's for my office. Yep. Yeah. Specific applications. Hello. Hello.
question was, uh, the policy applies to charging decisions, not investigative activity. So uh, is, is there any uh, point in perhaps having a, a comparable policy that applies to investigations rather than just prosecutions? Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting point. Um, I don't think we have considered it, in part because at least we haven't yet detected a problem, but hopefully engagements like this would flag that. And if we did see a problem, it's something we you know, certainly could consider whether a, 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 a similar policy on the investigative level would make sense. Um, at this point, it doesn't exist, and we haven't really thought of it. Uh, but you know, could that change if, if there actually were a need? Absolutely. Uh, 
have about only about five more minutes before we have to clear the room for the next panel. And let everyone else also know, uh, if you don't have one of these limited edition DEF CON policy stickers, please feel free to see me. I laid them out on the table, but I know that the folks that were standing didn't uh, get one. If you want one, uh, then hit me up. Yes? Another time, but there is in fact a lot of opportunity. Yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you to the people that were standing the whole time. Yeah. Uh, and again, let me know if you want a sticker and hope to see you around.